Welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 12. My name's Adil Mob, and I have Misophonia. This week, I'm talking to Maisie, an art history student who took a few years off before starting college, in no small part due to Misophonia. We talk about healthy and unhealthy coping mechanisms, interesting sleeping arrangements, and other ways to live with a partner. Maisie is a big fan of the podcast and says it has really helped to listen to all the past guests. So thank you again for to everyone who's come on. Still have lots of recorded interviews that I'll be rolling out over the next few months. And then I'll start recording season three in the fall. So stay tuned for interview slots. This week, I want to give a miso list shout out to Chloe Worthington's Society6 face masks and more. Chloe is actually the genius behind the Misophonia Memes Instagram account that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. She's created a line of face masks for COVID life and are available at her Society6 page. Link in the show notes or at misolist.com. Remember, if you're uh, at a business owned that's, um, that's owned by Misophone or employs Misophones, please let me know. You can go to misolist.com, M-I-S-O-L-I-S-T.com, and click the add button. And this is a, a great way for us to all support each other. All right, here's my conversation with Maisie. Maisie, welcome welcome to the podcast. Good to have you here. Hi. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, as a listener, you know that uh, I like to find out kind of uh, where folks are located. Well, we're currently right now I'm in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I moved here about a year ago to transfer to Winthrop University. Gotcha. Cool. And you're, um, you're a student there? I am. I'm studying art history. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So, um and I'll post in the in the show notes uh, a couple of your Instagram accounts, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's totally of, fine. A lot of great art done by Misophones, so I'm sure people would love to see it. Um, yeah. So okay, so you're 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 uh, you're at the university there. Um, I guess maybe what what's it like? Um, um, you know, being a student. I've talked to a bunch of students. Um, how how is it at your school? Yeah. Yes. Well, so that was the thing. I'm kind of a late start getting to college because I took a bunch of years off of high uh, after high school. So getting back into college was very much stressful, like going to classes, being around a lot of people. And that's kind of when the misophonia started to really get heightened and I had to address it for sure. Gotcha. So it's the, uh, the usual eating and various sounds enclosed in a tiny room. Oh, absolutely. Like those big lecture halls. That's where it really got me. It was actually in a psychology class that I finally broke and uh, had to go to my professor and say, look, like, I know you allow eating in here, but it, I can't do it. I can't come to class. And, and what did they say? She, she, she sympathized with me and she said, I know I get it. I have a friend who has it. And I think that's the first time I'd ever talked to somebody wow. who, yeah, wasn't like a friend or a family member that kind of sympathized with me. And, she recommended going to the counseling services through the school because it was free. And uh, I finally started going to therapy and talking about it. Gotcha. Okay. And then did that teacher kind of um, make any accommodations, like let you? She definitely was like, you know, I mean, the class size was, I don't know, 40 to 50 people. So she's like, you know, I can't really make that you know, tell everyone to not bring in food or anything mm. like that. But if you need to leave, like, just give me the look and head out. And I'm, I'm not going to be, <laughs> we, know the, we know how to do the look. So yeah, exactly. So I definitely had that, that freedom and relief of, okay, I can leave and not feel, you know, too awful about it. Like have to come back and explain myself. And that's sometimes I think, I feel like helps just knowing that you have that thing to lean on. Um, Absolutely. Yeah helped you get through it by time boxing and whatnot. Okay, yeah. so um, you, you, you did say in uh, kind of an email that uh, it's, it's been kind of 20 years in the making. Do you want to kind of maybe take us back to the early days of your, um, of your misophonia? Yeah, and I think it's, it's pretty familiar for everybody who has misophonia. It um, tends to start pretty early in life. So I have memories of being like six or seven and being really triggered at the dinner table i have an older brother who would drive me nuts on purpose um, or so just kind of <laughs> no that's just him he still kind of is that yeah. way <laughs> so the the closer um you are yeah the closer not is in like 
distance closer as in like emotionally connected mm. i think uh, even to this day like my my mom is like my best friend i love her so much but she is my biggest trigger like i cannot even you know be in a kitchen with her with the anticipation of maybe her eating something or drinking something and does she realize that and kind of Yes, she is probably my biggest supporter other than my partner that I live with right now. She totally gets it. Um, there's been definitely a lot of times where it's like, okay, I'm going to have my chips now. And I'll be like, all right, going to go do something else. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And then was she, was she your first trigger back in the day or was that, was that your brother? I would say my brother for yeah. sure. Okay. What about your yeah. dad? Yeah, I hear a lot about dads. So. Uh, my dad for sure, yeah. Um that and that's the thing is like I think my parents didn't really become a trigger for me until maybe my teen years mm -hmm. when I started to really notice and um never been a fan of the dinner table at all. Yeah, overrated. <laughs> Still do not like it at all. <laughs> do not like the idea of it. So what do you do in that situation? Uh, well, how, how's uh, your... So yeah, so throughout the last couple of years, since I started therapy um at my school uh i've been a little bit more open about it like hey you know it's thanksgiving you know that i got this thing um i'm probably just going to be in the kitchen or just wandering around like i might sit down for a little bit and kind of mm -hmm. grit my teeth but for the most part i'm pretty much allowed to kind of we're a little non-traditional family <laughs> anyway yeah. so yeah. it's it's totally understandable okay yeah that's that's yeah i hear people do that like uh sit down for a little bit, move around, maybe help with dishes or spend a lot of time Absolutely. in the bathroom. Absolutely. I'm that person. Yeah. Kind of finishing up and be like, all right, can I get your plate? Can I go, you know, clean up? Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So yeah, growing up, you had that, you know, the, the family experience. Um, how did that, um, you know, did it start with a, uh, a just kind of family? Did it, did it start to affect uh, elementary school, high school? You know, looking back on it now, I do think um, I was affected. I just had no idea what it was. It seemed to be like I had a really, really hard time with school all throughout my life. Like I, you know, going to elementary school, being dropped off, I would just be crying. Oh. But we didn't really know, you know, why am I so upset? Why am I so like have so much anxiety about going to this place? Um, so I don't think I really realized that until after I graduated high school and found the word misophonia and kind of connected with it and was able to look back retrospectively and did you remember kind of make those connections yeah did you spe remember any specific memories that led you to that i don't remember any specific memories but even to this day when i think about a cafeteria i cringe <laughs> gotcha yeah so there's some pavlovian I, thing that's oh, built yeah. up i'm sure there was there was a lot of it i just mentally like could not make the connection do you think that um was part of the decision to kind of like take some gap years after high school absolutely because um i even actually technically dropped out of high school i think middle of my junior year but they had just started doing online school so i actually got my diploma online from mm. an e-academy um but yeah, I had really, really intense anxiety. And by the time I got to high school, I just couldn't deal with it. I would go to, I would go into class and have panic attacks. And I think a lot of that was just built up misophonia plus other things like just depression and anxiety and all of that. Were you seeing therapists for some of that stuff? Um... I had not seen a therapist until I started college. That was my first time. And that was just there. like recent college, like your Rec yeah, recently. Yeah. I mean, I think about a year and a half ago, I started therapy, and, uh, but I would say it's still there, hundred percent. I still recognize it. Gotcha. So you you said after high school is when you learned that it had a name. How did that? How did you? How did you find out what it was? Yeah. So um, when I graduated high school, I was like nineteen, I decided to move in with my boyfriend at the time. Uh, we were together, we lived together for about a year. And I remember that's when like triggers all the time. And he was actually in school. So, you know, he had to stay up late, you know, work on the computer. And I just remember all the sounds and eating was very difficult. And there was no name for it. There was no way to really express it. 
to the point where he had under he would understand it so we got frustrated with each other a lot and ended up breaking up and i think about a couple months after that he sent me an article with that name misophonia and he was like this is you and i remember reading it thinking like wow okay but also it was so early on like it's like people still don't know what it is that you know it took a while to really really connect with it and, and accept that like okay this is something legitimate was it a bit of a kind of relief when you got that absolutely yeah. a relief in a way of like whenever i would have bad days specifically with like a lot of triggers and feeling like really isolated i could you know go online and maybe search about it read about it and kind of be cathartic in that way yeah okay so you um start to uh kind of uh read read about it to kind of uh try to help treat it yeah so what did you start to do next uh to kind of get over it so um after you learn more about it did you learn about coping mechanisms and stuff and start to implement things yeah and i think i'm still you know to this day struggling to to um really kind of get away from self-medication and try to do some other coping mechanisms um as far as i have really had success with is just kind of being open with my partner um who is very understanding like just even before on this call he comes up to me and says you know i'm about to go brush my teeth like thank you put in my headphones like (laughs) just kind of like you know being open about it um trying not to let it build up um i do have uh parts of my life where i've gotten addicted to earbuds for sure um earplugs i try to do those kinds of things yeah so that um i don't mean uh um um do do you do you write a little bit based on that but that 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 is one thing that uh you know i i will search for i will be on the verge of buying like airpods every once in a while Mm -hmm. and then i'll be like damn if i can't see myself taking these out and how that would be terrible um Mm -hmm. and so you know it just being able i have lots of earbuds but i think Mm -hmm. uh, i'll get as far as just kind of having them within arm's reach but oh yeah uh, Mm -hmm. but the idea of just kind of keeping them in my ear which what is what some of these things are designed to do just seems um seems like too much of a an addiction (laughs) and uh, oh yeah and i do like i fantasize sometimes i'm like oh i just wish there was some kind of like ear like hidden ear bug or earbud that i could put in my um ear and just tap it and then it'll be silence and then like untap it so it's just like unnoticeable but you know helpful yeah so okay so you um we were talking about um yeah you put your headphones on um when (laughs) when you're when your partner was brushing his teeth um and so you so your okay so your have been one way that you've um you've kind of uh, been hooked on them in the past yeah any yeah. anything else that you've uh that you've self-medicated with um so i will say when i wrote that first original email to you i did want to kind of put a warning of like you know recognizing that a lot of my coping mechanisms are super unhealthy um definitely in my teen years when it started to really get heightened Um, because I was just around so many people and going to school and my family. And um, I really turned to drinking a lot, especially like during dinner. Um, Even to this day, like after turning 21, like if I go to a restaurant, I'm going to get a drink because it does like soften that blow. And so that's something I've always really turned to. And even Thanksgiving, you know, I've been, you know, discussing it with my family of like how to kind of, get around it but i know in the past like i'll just get there and i'll start having some wine and like it'll just you know by the time it's dinner time i'm kind of like all right i'm ready to pass out yeah is there a point where it gets um it definitely takes the edge off is there a point where it kind of um it takes you into maybe a more ranty kind of uh, edgy kind of uh mode or is does it just kind of go to passing out and then you're kind of done (laughs) done for the night I think yeah, it's 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 just because there's some uh, some alcohols like you know whiskey that can turn people into very kind of ranty it, fighting or know. angry. Yeah, 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 so I know what you mean. Um, I would say it's it's just I exhaust myself. Is it what I think mm. I do with mm-hmm. it? 
um, because it's it's the anticipation, it's the actual event, and then it's on top of that of self medicating and just really trying to wear myself out. It feels like jumpy, jittery anxiety. Um, so I think alcohol has definitely become a friend in that. Yeah. So you said you started using it in in um, you know before before college. So obviously before you knew what misophonia was. So it was, yes. you were just kind yes. of generally using it for you know the things you were feeling. I guess. Oh yeah. Right, yeah. Whatever oh, yeah. it was. Okay. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And so, um, and so, how did, did that evolve over time? Like more or less? Or have you learned? Uh, has, is it still? Uh, you know, it's still. I don't. It can you know, alcohol can obviously get get into destructive um, ways. But has it? Yeah. Uh, is it still kind of helpful? Yeah. Uh, how do you? What's your relationship with it, with it now? Um, I think it's. I wouldn't say it's a better relationship, but it's a more aware relationship. Mm-hmm which I guess in some aspects that is, that's good. The first thing is to kind of like admit it and take it head on. And it's something I'm still talking about in therapy. And there's some days where I'm just like, I don't want to talk about this. And some days where I'm like, we need to address this. Um, and that's how it kind of feels with the misophonia too, is like some days are good. Some days I feel like, oh, it's not that bad. Like this, nobody wants to hear me gripe about this. And then other days I'm like, no, this is real. Um, I've got to kind of tackle it. So it really just depends on my energy levels. If I'm having a bad day, yeah, I'm probably going to drink a lot. Um, if I'm having a good day, I feel like, yeah, okay, I don't need anything. And have you noticed? I can distract any, myself. Yeah. Have you noticed any patterns on those uh, good, bad misophonia days? Like, uh, you know, we know stress is one, one of the, probably the number one um, uh, factor. Yeah. I, yeah. I think uh, I think a lot of it, it has to do with um, being out of control, for sure. So anytime there's, like, I have to be somewhere, like either in a classroom or at a family gathering, um, it starts to get a little more heightened, that, that sense of how can I escape if I need to. Because, like, misophonia is, like, the fight or flight thing. And for so long, like, I had been fighting it. But I think I've gotten more into just trying to run away from it. Um, I know in therapy, there's been a lot of suggestions of, you know, uh, learning how to relax your muscles or, you know, talk about my therapist, like eating chips and trying to do that kind of thing. Like try to get me to a heightened, really heightened place and then bring me back down. But to me, that just sounds like a nightmare. Exposure like, therapy, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, oh. yes. It sounds like such a nightmare. Um, so I just try to take it. Take it. Um, really, the best advice I can give is, like, take it moment by moment. You don't anticipate too much. But if you do anticipate, just start thinking about the ways, like, you can maybe get around it or, or deal with it. I know everybody is different, so... You know, you got to find your own thing. Yeah, there's been a couple of times when I've just kind of tried to tell my brain silently that uh, mm-hmm. whatever's happening is not meant mm-hmm. to hurt you. No, you know, yeah. it's, and then mm-hmm. it actually has a separate, if you can just go inside yourself and think that, I think, I mean, I need to do that more because I usually don't remember to do that, but that there might be something mm-hmm. there. Okay, so yeah, other than the alcohol, any other, yeah, any, anything else that you're, maybe your therapist is kind of, uh, pointed you pointed you towards so i will say this is pretty crazy because um so for so long i of course aware of therapy but never felt like i needed it or felt justified to be there i I suppose okay and it wasn't with everything you were going through um, yeah like i mean it just had become so normal that i was like man if i go to therapy they're not gonna understand they're gonna try to do something else i don't know what they're gonna do with me but finally, when that one professor said, hey, you know, go, go talk to them. Um, it was amazing because the therapist I had, and I love him so much, I miss him. He was at my old school. He was like, you know, I was reading your notes before coming in and you said misophonia. And he goes, it's really strange because I have misophonia. Mm. So this whole new world kind of opened up for me and, um, just became super elated that like, oh my God, I just met somebody, an adult, like who has it too. And also is now my therapist. And that really, really helped me, um, 
he just knew what to say. We would just kind of talk about it in a casual way, which felt very, very good. Um, Interesting. I think okay. those are the yeah. those are the best moments in therapy is when you're just um, you're justified in being there. You're you know, I forget the word I'm trying to think. <laughs> Feel validated or um, validation. Yeah. Yes, validation. That's it feeling validated and and that this is something that affects your life daily in a negative way and i have to kind of remember that and those are the best times in therapy i think is when i when i get that validation of yeah you know you you belong here you know you you have legitimate issues gotcha okay and uh and speaking of the um i guess uh you know the the triggers that you have we won't go into the details i'm curious um Oh, so many. So I could list. Sometimes I list them. <laughs> yeah. Could you? What, what's kind of yeah. basic categories? Let's 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 keep it kind of general yeah. there. Yeah. And that's something I've done in therapy too. Like, hey, let's just like list them. Um, of course, we've got the eating. Um, those all those range of sounds. Brushing teeth is a big one. That's a daily one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I won't let my mom wear flip flops. I can't stand it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Clipping nails, yes. tapping on the keyboard, like especially the older keyboards. Those are really clunky. Um, and what about visual triggers? That's something that you know you hear about a lot. Visual. Yeah, with my mom, it's really big visual triggers. Like I can't stand when she uh, puts on lipstick or drinks <laughs> through a straw. I don't. I don't even know if she knows that if I've ever told her, but. Those definitely, I think, uh, with my mom. Did you notice that early on too, the visuals, or was that something that kind of? I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think that happened around the same time that I just started to get triggered by her eating in a room with me. Gotcha. And it seems so strange. I don't know if I said that, but it seems like the closer I become with someone, like emotionally, um, the worse it gets. It's so ironic Especially, because it's. Uh, I know, it's, yeah. The more you love someone, it's like the the more you can't stand to see them like do daily things that they have to do. So I'm, I mean, yeah, that's really interesting. The other, one thing I want to dive into though is, uh, it seems like you, the, those people that you've told, maybe maybe it's a function of that, but they've it turns out they're pretty supportive. I'm curious mm-hmm. how that kind of conversation went early on. Like, how did you tell them? whether it's a mm-hmm. partner or your, or your mom and what their reaction was. Yeah. And I will, I'll start off by saying that, yes, they are supportive, but in reality, like it can be pretty bad. Like feelings get hurt, you know, fights can start. Yeah. But I think the, I can't remember having a conversation with my mom. Uh, I think she just noticed, I think just her being around, like obviously, I'm super uncomfortable and that just became a routine with us maybe my mid-teen years like okay I'm not gonna you know eat around her she even has jokingly said which is like kind of (laughs) dark but like you gave me an eating disorder and yeah we can make jokes and laugh about it which does help but there's some days where I think about that and I'm like oh my god like I'm 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 impeding on their lives now yeah, this like I'm making I'm making them feel bad. So I think that 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 comes with um, opening it up to people about it. And yes, they understand, and of course they want to you know work with me on it. But also, like the reality of is it that we are just you know all humans. We get our feelings hurt about it, and you know they see my face, and there's like this level of disgust that's being registered by them, and and they hate to be the source of that even though I tried to explain like you're not the source it's the misophonia I mean it's not you it's not me it's the misophonia and now that I have that word I think it's easier to talk about it and kind of have that conversation but it's still rough like you don't want to ever make anybody feel like that they're the you know bad one or they're the problem right and what about um what about strangers like uh, going on in daily life like people you meet at school or or outside mm-hmm. at you know um do you do you, t- do you tell people about it and, and um or, or how no, do you do it? I just run? yeah yeah i haven't um uh especially like thinking now when i'm around those people it, it's it's at school it's in classes there has not been one case where i've i've told 
another classmate. Uh, there's been a couple times where I've had to walk out of a classroom or just walk away from people, which tends to be okay. And, and like I said, it seems to get kind of more intense the closer I am with someone. So some of these strangers that I don't really know or see very often, I can kind of deal with. Um, what about friends, like, you know, who are not? No, loved ones per se, but mm -hmm. I do have a memory of you know being in high school and I had a friend over and we were best friends and sitting on the couch at the end of the night we're watching TV and I just remember her just munching on a bag of chips and having that rage and but but also feeling like I can't say anything to this person mm. like they're not doing anything. Um, so I think for a long time I was probably just seemed kind of standoffish. I think a lot. Um, probably made it a little hard to make friends or get closer to people. Have you, um, what kind of jobs have you had? Have you, um, <laughs> let's, let's go there. And this is also one of the most ironic things that I also have gotten from my therapist is like, why do you work in restaurants? Why oh, are you, yeah. I've been a server for so long and worked in customer service and, um, I think there's something to be said about having that white noise or that kind of background noise. Like when you're in your restaurant, there's lots of people talking, there's things going on, um, music playing. There have been times like with coworkers or a table where I just had to walk away. But for the most part, no, I'm, I stay pretty busy. I stay pretty focused and it doesn't seem to bother me there. Yeah, I guess you're moving around a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, you mm -hmm. can uh, immediately bring the check. <laughs> yeah, to, yep. Uh, move yep. along. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, there's obviously we don't have to get into all the possible sounds that ha that happen in an environment like mm -hmm. that. And um, you know, after I mean, so uh, you're you're doing art hist you're studying art history in in, uh, mm -hmm. in in school. Have you thought about like um, where you want this to go? Like what kind of job you want in the future that might be amenable to this? You know, I'm still not really sure. I'm just, I just really love studying this subject. Um, I found my confidence in school has, has really gone up over the past, you know, few That's semesters. Great. And and I'm writing a lot, I'm researching a lot, and I could maybe see a career in that. And that's very much like I could do that from home or yeah. do that in a quiet office. Um, I mean, I do love working with people too. And I, I think like I can, I can pursue pretty much any career that I really want to. Um, it's just those little in-between things where someone's like, hey, you want to have lunch today? Or you're in a meeting with people and somebody's brought their breakfast in. It's it's those things that I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with. Yeah, I've told people you cannot eat during like, uh, you know, Zoom yeah, calls or, yeah. um, and that's something that you know, a lot of, I think is one, one of those things that's relatively can be norm normalized across oh, yeah. all human all, all humans yeah. so that's that's should be doable but it, it yeah it often does take somebody speaking up about that yeah I, i've already thought like because everyone's on the zoom call now that um if that were to happen i was just like hey can you mute your mic and that seems very like yeah for what I, you know sometimes people just need to mute their mic maybe there's some feedback i don't really have to go in to explain why i think that's the hardest part is like you you anticipate people being like well why why yeah. you know why are you so upset why do why can i do what i want to do you know yeah. the freedom of, of eating or whatever right it, it can be a little painful when they unmute in, in mid mid chew but we won't get into mm -hmm. that um cool okay um yeah and so so uh, other than your your therapist have you met other people with misophonia Nope, I have not. I think you're probably like the second one. Yeah, that's Honestly. that's yeah. I've, I've heard a yeah. bunch of interviews of interviewees have said that that uh, this is kind yeah. of their first or second time. Yeah, and also I kind of consider like I've listened to so many of your episodes and and I'm really impressed by the wide variety of people that you have been able to talk with and. Um, I kind of consider all those people I've now, you know, semi, you know, vicariously met that have misophonia. Do you think uh, I feel a bigger group? I feel a little more like, okay, I could, I could start maybe a club at school, maybe put up some posters and say, hey, do you have misophonia? This is what it is. And maybe kind of meet more people in real life. So by the time, uh, by the time this airs, I will have aired actually the um, an interview I did with... Um, the um, the founder of the US, UCLA Misophonia Support Group. 
Um, mm -hmm. You should take a look. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what the, the group there, but uh, there's a, there's a mm -hmm. group there that I think is kind of the, the first one in the country where some students just got together and started a <gasps> misphonia group. Um, nice. They've got an Instagram. Um, I think I'm a, we're, we follow them on Instagram. But yeah, and, and you, um, um, you should reach. You should reach out. Uh, I, maybe I can connect you guys and kind of like, get some tips because I've been trying to like see that happen. Try to try to get that to happen across the country. Yeah. The world. No, that'd be um, wonderful. I'm. I'm very. And if you start that, started, please let me know. Uh, I'll, I'll. I'll. You know, promote absolutely. it as much as possible because I think. Yeah. Because I think. Um, yeah, getting getting that getting that community going in college will I think help people and when they get out to the workforce and just generally so. Yeah. And there's still just so much like, and I'm so, so happy. I'm like three hours from Duke University and they've been on my radar for a couple of years of doing a lot of research. Um, and I'm just super, yes, super happy. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that, that, that is becoming more of a conversation. And I think the biggest thing that I'd want to do in a group or is just kind of like, let's talk about it. I think that's been the biggest thing for me is like, I'm not really, you know, of course, I'm always open to, do you have any coping mechanisms? You know, what, what, what works for you? But I think also just talking about it, just feeling like a, a real person, you know, feeling connected uh, really, really helps. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I That's why I kind of like try to get these to be pretty casual and free form. Yeah. Having yeah. been to a couple of the conventions, like uh, where it's a couple of days, there's a couple, there's a bunch of talks, but uh, I start going less and less to the talks and more and more into the, the lobby <laughs> conversations and that's kind of yeah. where the real power is i think you know, yeah just, just talking definitely about it. um because when, when you read about it online it's just kind of these very uh you know cliche articles with clickbait pictures and kind mm -hmm. of a you know a story that's meant to shock you about somebody's reaction mm -hmm. but um yeah it's just kind of like conversations like uh, hearing about your art actually has has um has the miso kind of um those emotions kind of like uh, infiltrated into your into your art honestly I don't think it has I mean I've been I've just always been a maker I just make stuff I can use pretty much any material um, but I don't really think it's translated into it too much or at least I don't I'm unconscious of it um, but yeah I think uh, if anything in my art I deal with a lot of um, just building your own worlds like right now I'm making a bunch of miniature rooms which oh, seems kind of yes, kind I of funny. Those. With I yeah. saw miniature rooms in, uh, in in Chicago Art Institute. Um, mm -hmm. I actually got a book on those. Um, yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe it's just coming out of this time where we are all staying at oh, home yeah. and <laughs> kind of yeah. creating new rooms to go visit. Because I mean, how many places in my house can I hang out at? Um, so I think that that always that idea, and even being younger when I'm you know, depressed or have anxiety or want to leave because of misophonia trigger is like having these escaped, uh, imagined places, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, so during quarantine lockdown, oh, how, how has your misophonia changed if it has at all? Um, I'd say it's about the same. I think, um, I'm a big smoker too, but that's, but that's actually gone down since I've been at home. I think when I'm out in the world, I'm way more triggered. But since being home, I've had a strange relief of kind of security. Also, I, I you know, you, every day changes, you don't know what's going to happen. But also, I'm kind of implementing that, like, just take every day at a time. And also knowing that I'm going to be at home is, you know, a routine. And I think routines are really important, especially for misophonia is to who is might your, have that kind of control issue. Yeah. Is your partner at home too with you? Yes, okay. he is. Um, he's a high school teacher at the moment. Um, so he's been dealing with, that is not, know, uh, that would not be an ideal job for a misophone. Yeah. Let's put that out yeah. there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, but I will say, um, my partner that I'm with Zach, he, we've been together for four years now. Uh, we were three years long distance, but when we moved to Rock Hill, this is the first time we've lived in a house together. 
And one of the first things I said is we're having separate bedrooms. Mm, yeah. Okay. okay. And I, it, he was totally cool with it. He's fine. We got this, we got the perfect house. We have separate bedrooms. He's at the front of the house. I'm at the back of the house. Um, we have our own offices in our room. So he's got his own, he does all of his stuff in his room. But I think that is like the most smartest thing for like a misophone or any kind of couple is just to have your separate spaces. Yeah, when um, I was young and cooler, uh, you know, I thought it was oh, open office loft, oh, oh, not like open yeah. concept loft, just so yeah. hip and cool. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that would probably be a disaster. So now I have like a, you know, three stories plus a basement. Um, yeah. That vertical height is, is big yeah. because if you get a nice thick floor, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. Any, any other kind of like house architectural <laughs> tips that you have? <laughs> um, I, no, not really. I think just like I'm so particular about all the items I have and the rooms I have. And this makes so much sense that I've been making these like little miniature room models. But I think just having your space, really, really making it yours is very comforting and may, will make you feel safer. Yeah, lots of small welcomed. rooms. I like that. Mm -hmm. And also, I think a lot of times the misophonia when you, when, you know, being triggered by the people you love and it could hurt their feelings. I think, you know, for them to have an escape too. Um, a lot of times when we love making food and especially being home now, we make homemade meals every night and we enjoy and love doing that. But I feel a little more comforted now because the anticipation of eating at a table is gone. We've established, I'm going to go to my bedroom or I'm going to go outside or, you know, we kind of eat separately, but make food together. And I think yeah. that's a, like a compromise in some ways. Yeah. That's really nice. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I know some people are having a terrible time during lockdown, but uh, it's good to hear mm -hmm. those, those there. Yeah. There's, there's some good and bad. And there's uh, exactly that's, a, that's yeah. a good way to deal with meal times, I think. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, maybe we should start to kind of uh, wind down, but I kind of, uh, mm -hmm. I know you've put, uh, thought about this a lot uh, since January. I'm curious, are there any, kind of, uh, any other um, things you want to kind of tell people who are listening? Um, and obviously this being kind of your f first or second time talking about misophonia um, mm -hmm. with, a, with a stranger. Yeah, any, anything you want to tell the, tell the audience? Uh, I know I thought about this so much of like, what's my sign off? But uh I just really, really want to tell anybody who's struggling, like, obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, you, you feel like you want to learn more about it, just talk to somebody with it or be open about your own experiences with it. I think it's really important to, to feel validated and make each other feel validated. Yeah, I will second that. Uh, a lot of us have gotten so good at bottling things up that we mm -hmm. probably don't even realize how kind of a, mm -hmm. much of a relief it is to talk to somebody about it mm -hmm. um, and also nobody is normal nobody's normal i mean whatever you make your life that's going to be normal for you and that's okay i think a lot of people feel like a freak or or they can't live in you know the world but they can you know i'm doing it <laughs> yeah yeah you know many of us are making and, it happen and our guests are a testament to that too so um yeah, yeah well uh maybe Thank, thanks again for, for coming on. Thank it's good you. to finally talk to you. Thank and, you so uh, much. Yes. Thank you, Maisie. And thanks everyone for listening. You can email hello at misophoniapodcast.com with your thoughts or find us on Instagram or Facebook at Misophonia Podcast or on Twitter too at Misophonia Show. Don't forget to check out the Miso List at misolist.com and music as always is by Moby. I hope you're having a great summer or if you're catching up on on this uh, later in the year, as always, I wish you peace and quiet.